and we are live greetings and salutations beautiful beans and thank you so much for joining us today for a very special world anvil stream because we have luminaries wolfgang and celeste with us <laughs> wolfgang how are you doing i'm doing fantastic thank you and celeste how are you doing uh great i'm really excited to, to be here and back on the channel to chat some nerd stuff today Chat some nerdy stuff. That's what we love to do here. So we, of course, today are talking about how to write a campaign setting. So today we're going to be talking about where you start, what you should be avoiding, what you should make sure you are including, as well as a ton of other things that you may not have even thought about on your journey to writing a campaign setting. But we've all done it, so we will try and help you. Um, Wolfgang, I think you said that you've written 10 campaign settings is that correct or reasonable chunks thereof i think for planescape i wrote planes of law planes of chaos and this city book for sigil so i didn't write the first book but i still feel like i contributed yeah come on come on <laughs> 10 campaign settings people so wolfgang yeah. of course is one of the biggest names in tabletop gaming as well as being the head cobalt over at cobalt press he and the main brain behind the midgard setting he's also worked on ghosts of salt marsh courts of the Fa shadow fey tome of beasts cobalt Gaita monsters scarlet citadel for fifth edition southlands for fifth edition vault of magic and and what's the yes? name, Wolfgang? oh the book of ebon tides no it's not yeah. out yet <laughs> but it's coming so close <laughs> yes no tome of heroes is shipping very shortly Ooh. but it's not a campaign setting it's a player's guide i'm off topic already <laughs> oh no oh no <laughs> <laughs> okay okay we'll uh we'll we'll give you penalty points that's fine uh <laughs> celeste you've done six campaign settings is that correct yeah yeah so six. i've had the privilege of working on a bunch so including stuff for cobalt press and some other uh 5e publishers uh as well as working on my own campaign setting guide the venture man's campaign guide which is coming out in pdf form in like a month so yeah, uh, and some of those I've written a lot, some some a little. I helped build out parts of, um, obviously, Icewind Dale when I was writing on Rime of the Frost Maiden. Uh, so, yeah, I've it's a lot of fun. It's hard. Uh, I'm excited to talk about it <laughs> today. I'm particularly excited to talk about Venture Maidens, because often when we're talking about campaign settings that have been written, we're talking about things that have been created as products from the start to be played on games. But right, right. Uh, Venture Maidens was the opposite. Venture, Venture Maidens was was a home game mm -hmm. slash That became a stream, podcast. that became a, yeah, that became a book, so. Yeah, so it's taken a really yeah. different route. So I'm really, really excited to talk about that today. Six campaign settings, wow. Celeste Gonowich is a game designer based out of Seattle. She is the producer, DM, and editor of the actual play podcast, Venture Maidens. Yeah, you heard it here. <laughs> when not plotting behind the screen, you can catch her uh, championing femme lead shows as co-founder of the Penwich Studio, Penwich? Penwich. Penwich. Yeah. Penwich Studio Podcast Network. And, and she's a senior game designer at uh, Cobalt Press. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and also worked on the book of Ebon Tides as far mm -hmm. as I believe. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Co wrote, co wrote that, uh, that bad boy. We have different views of that book, I'm sure, but we both <laughs> put in about a half of it. So, yes. Quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll get around to that one. It's a campaign setting. Yeah. It's a campaign yeah. setting. I'm sure, we'll so... have a few things to say. <laughs> I would say, without further ado, let's jump in to the good stuff, starting, of course, at the very beginning. Where do you start building a campaign setting? Boom. Go. Yes. Well, <laughs> I don't think there's one answer to this, but I think traditionally you sort of mentioned two of them. It's your home campaign that grows out of control, right? You alluded to this or it's a commercial product from the beginning and everyone says it's we want it to be this thing for this sort of player right which is a very different beginning um i think the growing out of your home campaign the good news there is you already have notes you already have a direction the bad news is you're probably doing it all wrong from a commercial perspective I know what the notes looked like for the Forgotten Realms when they were sent in to be turned into a commercial product, and it was reams of material, which 
Ed Greenwood understood and everyone else, like it, there was an editing and development process that had to take that from, it's a fantastic home campaign to, we can publish this product and people will love to play it. Um, when you start from a commercial perspective, it's different, right? You can say the cover art's gonna look like this, now write the setting behind it, or um, we're going to use Psyonix as a foundational element of this setting, work with that. Um, so you can set the markers differently. Yeah, That's a list. I mean, you should talk about Venture Maidens and how that went from, <laughs> right? Where did you start? Yeah, well, I think somewhere I always like to start for any design and I think is supremely helpful for campaign settings is looking at what people need and then trying yes. to create an idea based around that. So what is the niche that isn't being filled? Do we need a certain kind of magical world that hasn't been seen? Do we need another, you know, medieval high fantasy style world? Probably not, but do we maybe need a oh, world with magic trains or, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. It has to be, you, you start with an idea and like what it is about that world that is unique. What is the thing? So like on the Book of Ebon Tides, for instance, it's like, this is a face splattered world, right? with these shadowy undercurrents that's something that was really needed to enhance the midgard setting to build out this idea of ley lines so that was that was fulfilling a need and same with like venture maidens for example it was fulfilling a need for a femme-led show was the the whole intention of creating the show in the first place and then so building that world that was all about the character driven and the the idea of destiny and how that actually manifests in a very real way in a campaign setting like geography or like the fact that there is gravity that led to the creation of the campaign setting to fulfill that need yeah I mean, I think we can look at historic, and I think we're just going to be talking about D&D here mostly, historically published settings, right? Uh, Spelljammer fulfilled a need for not D&D in space, although that's the hook, but for uh, high action piracy, yeah. nautical, high magic uh, gaming that connected, oh, I don't know, all of the spheres, all of the other worlds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah that that tsr was publishing at the time or i don't know dark sun let's make a gritty survival, survival. game yeah with gladiatorial arenas and dragons who you don't want to meet really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i i agree it's it's really about what story are you trying to tell what audience the difference between your home game and a commercial product is your home game, you are pleasing a known quantity of people, mm -hmm. right? You're starting by saying, I'm running this for my friends. And in a commercial product, you have to say, I'm making a campaign setting for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and it needs to work for them. So utility is high on my list there. Yeah. And when it comes to hooks or USPs, what we call unique selling points, essentially. So that's what you mentioned. It's D&D &D in space or D&D &D high octane pirate adventure. Um, how do you develop those and how do you test them? How can you know if your USP is good before you start doing all the rest of the work, right? <laughs> yeah, I think just read everything you can. Uh, I think you have to, if you want to be a successful designer of worlds, you have to study worlds. So read the books that are popular right now, whether, whether they be comic books, whether they be novels, look at the video games uh, that are coming out, look at the other campaign settings. Usually, as we go through these, these periods of time, uh, folks fall in love with the specific genres or demand more media of a certain kind. So as you study people you respect and other world builders that you see, uh, you can kind of see what, what they're putting forward and how strong that idea is. And if your idea feels like a comparable level to those folks, you're probably somewhere on the right path. Right. Yeah, I think looking at the competition is always great. I also have to admit that at least with the Midgard campaign setting, it was not, it's almost 10 years old now, so it has some history. But its initial iteration, the goal was to 
provide a framework for all the adventures that had already been written, yeah. right? Um, the audience was saying, we want to fill in all the spaces in between the Marguerite Forest and the Iron Crags and the city, Zobek. And we were like, well, they were meant to be separate, distinct. You just slot them into your home game. And so the unique selling point to some degree when Midgard started was we can connect all the Lego pieces that have been separate so far. And what I learned after publishing the campaign setting, other than just how huge of a design lift it was to build a framework around a few existing adventures, what I learned was I didn't really know what the best unique selling points were. Um, some of that became obvious when the first edition of Bidgard went out and parts of it resonated with the audience and they said, give us more of that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a smart enough designer to know ahead of time exactly which pieces of your world will resonate most strongly, uh, hats off to you. But sometimes you don't know. Um, and we see this even in other campaign settings like Oh, I don't know, pick on the Forgotten Realms for a minute, right? Like the Red Wizards weren't that big a thing mm -hmm. in the early editions long, long ago. But over time, they've become a massive big deal. Yeah. Um, and, and other groups and societies that are part of the campaign setting that people enjoyed got support products. But that's a whole nother how to support your campaign setting is probably a whole separate a whole a whole time. Let's talk. Itself, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Let's we'll bring start it back. We'll get another one, one of these. Done. <laughs> um, fantastic. Uh, since we are talking about world building, I did just want to let you know there is a raffle going on for the Cobalt Guide to World Building at ah, Disappears and the Cobalt Guide to World Building too. There's two of them. Guys, Extreme these are awful. in the raffle right now. Exclamation <laughs> raffle to take part. Just a note, you must be a follower of the channel to win. And we'll be announcing the winner at the end of this live stream. Um, but let's go on with ingredients. I'm a big fan of components, ingredients. I think it's a very, very good way to eat an elephant is to break it down into its component parts. So yes. what has to be in a written campaign setting? What are the ingredients that should be included? Cold well, has a formula for this. Oh, I'd like to hear I, yeah. <laughs> I want to hear too. the formula. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's people, places, and magic, right? right. Is, is sort of the top line. Who's the movers and shakers? What, are, what can you be? What kind of hero you can be? That's people. And that's about player characters and non-player characters. Places, of course, is what's special about this world? What do I want to visit? And oh, for goodness sake, don't make it yet another, I don't know, well-run kingdom. Please show me how conflicted, awful, and terribly messed up it is uh, so that we can be excited about visiting the strangeness. Um, and magic, well, I mean, I write fantasy campaigns almost exclusively, and when it's not fantasy, it's cosmic horror. So um, from my perspective, putting something in like lightning rails and Eberron uh, is the particular form of magic not found elsewhere or ley lines in Midgard. Yeah. I don't know. I wanna... That's my three point formula. I'm trying to keep it compact. No, it's no, no, good. it's great. It's I want to pick on two things that you said there. Uh, one of which was in people, you talk about who the, who the players will be. And I think that that's something yeah. that is often forgotten is that player experience. Like what, uh, we talked to uh, Lawrence Schick the other day, and his his quote that I loved was, what kind of fun are we having here? Who, <laughs> yes. who am I going to be? And I thought that was such a clever quote. And that really, you know, that that's really what, what you spoke to as well there, Wolfgang, is what kind of fun are we having? Who are we going to be? Right. And how far is that going to go? Right. Yeah, In Book it's... of Ebon Tides, it's, it's, we're going to be shadow fey gnomes and bear folk, right? Like, yeah. yay. Yay. Yeah. You have to, whenever you're building a world, especially for 
world building specifically for games is a little bit different than building it for books or fiction or whatever because you do have to build in a way for people to adventure why are people adventuring in this world there has to be some kind of conflict that drives yeah. people to do this or some kind of reason and the more of that you can build into your world and consider at the very base level why your world is populated with adventurers running around uh, that's supremely helpful. So at every opportunity, when you can give a place for the reader to see themselves as an adventurer in the space, uh, you have a location that's like, oh my God, yes, uh, my hero should be from here. That's why this thing happened, this thing happened. So building that in, building in for the people is so key. And I think with magic too, there's also that hook built in there. So people who do want to play spellcasters can see, oh, how do I engage with this as as a character? How can I make my own stories based on this framework? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we'll be we'll be digging into some of those elements later. But absolutely, uh, the players have to be able to see what their place in the world is, and where they're going to go. And I think we're going to talk about um, common mistakes in a minute. But the, the mm. number of lovely, happy kingdoms I've seen where people are like, I just want to make a nice world. And I'm like, that's fine. Nothing but... is going to happen there. <laughs> it's fine if you build a nice world and then threaten to blow it up, right? I mean, right. there's then a you need external us. conflict. Right. <laughs> right. We start in the Shire, but we don't stay in the Shire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. OK, so we've talked about what has to be in there. We've talked about people, places and magic and uh, Really, another thing you said is, is sort of dialing those up to 11, like make them exciting, make them different, make it something that people really want. And um, I know you, Wolfgang, in your Cobalt Guide to Game Design, which I have read thoroughly, uh, talk a lot about the same but different. And I think that that's something that's quite important. It has to be understandable, but feel new. Yes, I... I'm always torn by this when putting forward setting material. On the one hand, there is a part of the audience that wants wildly original, never seen it before, wahoo, high fantasy space hippos. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, and at the same time, there are players showing up who would like to know who they are and what's going on. And when you say space hippos, they may say wahoo, but not every player does. Many players would prefer to say, is it a little like the British Navy, but with hippos? Yeah. Right? If you can connect it to anything, um, that helps. And the closer you are to the real world um, or real world cognates. touchstones, yeah. cognates, yeah, the easier it is for a new player uh, or someone who's just a you know casual friend wants to come over and play and you're like yeah come play but if it's too crazy and you're talking about crystals and space hamsters they may say i i thanks for showing me right they mm -hmm. may just not get it and the closer you are to the shire and the standard medieval fantasy the more they may go oh it's sort of king arthur robin hood i get it um that's a really hard spectrum to pick on, but when you're doing setting design, you kind of need to put a stake in it, right? Decide if you're going to be wild and wahoo, or if you're going to be sane but different. And Midgard does sane but different, right? Like it's Russia, but Baba Yaga really is eating all the gnomish children. And, um, you know, the Mongol hordes are centaurs, sane but different. Yeah, yeah I, I like for the hard and vast rule that I use uh, for world building is for every two new things you have in a world, you have to have at least one mm. really familiar thing. Mm, so like if that. you're building a whole new world and there's no gravity and everybody's an ooze person, uh, your third thing should be something relatable. Like maybe they're all capitalists, right? Like that's the, we relate to that. We understand <laughs> that, how that society works, but we have some kind of way to connect because we need to connect to the stories to feel like a part of them. If it's a totally alien world, we have nothing in common, nothing like for our context, it's gonna be hard to feel like you are empowered to be a hero in this world when nothing makes sense to you. So shake it up, you know, at least the one to two. And I feel like usually that will steer you right in a lot of ways. 
that's a that's a really solid piece of advice. I'm going to I'm yes. going to be quoting you on that one in the future. <laughs> Expect to be quoted on that in the future. Oh, for sure. So let's talk about RPG systems. Because this is always a hot topic. D&D 5e is very big. There are many other excellent game systems out there as well. How do you choose an RPG system for your campaign? What should you consider and how does it affect the game that you're you're creating, essentially? I know that's three questions, but I feel like it's actually one question. I'm willing to be the the flinty-hearted commercial bastard here for a moment and say ask yourself whether you want to make money and quit your day job or ask yourself whether you want full creative freedom to go in whatever direction and whatever rules preferences you have right because commercially speaking if you're publishing a campaign setting for anything other than dungeons and dragons you have a much harder row to hoe to get there now if you have an ip like last airbender right like if you if your avatar well, you're not building a new world, but you, you will sell plenty. Um, but otherwise, most tabletop RPG companies, it's very hard to, uh, to put out a system that is reaching a big enough audience, right? That you can quit your day job. Um, and I love the indies. <laughs> Don't get me <laughs> wrong. They're fantastic. I buy them. Sometimes I even play them but um, I don't expect years of support products from rule systems that might or might not be around in five years. Yeah. I mean, but that's really your choice. I don't know, Celeste, how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, definitely if money is the consideration, if you want to do this professionally, you have to look at the fantasy worlds. You have to look at that standard model where it is very heavy, heavy mechanics and a system we're all really familiar with. And that is going to inform a lot of the world because your heroes are so powerful and they scale at a rate that all these mechanical things, you really do have to have a specific kind of world to make that work. But if money isn't the big concern, if you're mostly creativity motivated, when you're choosing a system, I think to write for it, it depends a lot on the scope you want to go for. If you're going to build a really, you want it, all the details, you want to build a, a thousand locations and be really invested as a storyteller, really hands-on, obviously that isn't going to work for a lot of different game systems. Things like Powered by the Apocalypse games, for example, right. are very story driven between the players. So a lot of the world building is going to happen at the table, which means that you as the world builder making the setting guide need to back off in a lot of places and leave it very open for other people to yes. tell those stories. Or you could pick up games like write for games like Vasen, for instance, it is set in a specific fantasy Norwegian city. Like it's always in this city, right? And it's it's all about Norwegian folklore. So it's going to be very themed and very historically tied to a place and a feeling and a, a culture. So really looking for the kind of work you want to do and how much you want to be involved, how much you can let yourself not be involved, I think is going to inform a lot which kind of game system you need to end up writing for. Yeah, there is a fantastic essay, again, in the Cobalt Guide to Game Design, uh, which I do not currently have on my desk, uh, and should have brought, it's in the co on the coffee table over there. Um, but uh, that speaks very interestingly on this topic, and talks essentially about the idea that um, the best designed games, if you can say that in something that is, you know, trying to categorize fun, um, is are, are games that essentially the system supports the kind of fun. Thank you, Sparkly Assistant. Uh, the system supports the kind of fun that you are supporting at your table. So one of the reasons that everybody loves Call of Cthulhu so much is that the system is built for tension and stress and horror it, it it the mechanics within the system feed that which means when you're trying to do that as a setting and your system is also supporting that you have this beautiful synergy between the two and i think that's that's just one thing i would say in favor of systems that are not D D 5e D D 5e oh, is yeah. fine i play a lot of 5e i play a lot of other systems as well because i'm a big old nerd but um 
and, and what, like what I like to think of as a nerd's nerd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, essentially, like there there are there are a lot of other ways to go. You don't have to do five e, uh, and there's a lot to be said for finding a system that really supports the genre or the player experience or something. Sure. Although not every rule system is open and available, right? Yes. Um, there's a legal aspect as well. I've written for Call of Cthulhu, um, but the the mechanics are all chaosium, right? The, the the property is is sort of tied up there, yeah. and you can write something using the mythos. Yeah. Anyway, there's a whole discussion there about you no. know. Absolutely. Can I abstract these mechanics enough um, that they they support the the setting I want to do? But can I also get a license, perhaps? Um, because sometimes the publisher will grant you one um, to use their existing game system that's not open to the public otherwise. Yeah. So that's definitely another another consideration. Is okay. I want to use this, but can I? Because I know for a fact that there are some systems out there that don't grant licenses and aren't interested in in other party content in their in Although using that, their system. The trend is clear, like Cypher System just announced, right, that they're opening up yeah. their mechanics to others, which is wonderful to see. Uh, but until that happened, it was, you know, money cook games or or we're not doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when you're when you're trying to write your campaign setting and publish it. Uh, these are questions that you need to figure out early. You know, this is yes. this should be before you've written any world building or law or anything. This is yeah. this is something that you need to nail down right at the beginning because otherwise you're going to have a hell of a time trying to fudge things to put them into another system to bend the way that you've written something to work for something else. So uh, yeah, think about this early, guys. And speaking of world building, guys. How deep do we go? Let's start with law and world building because that's that's the the place that we all love to indulge. How <laughs> deep do you go in law and world building before you're only doing it for yourself? Oh gosh, you have to fight. You have to fight all of your instincts. I feel like the whole time. Um, well, well, you are world building because you always, always, always no matter what you make, you always need to start with the stuff that is actually going to appear during a game. So that means starting small and spiraling outward, right? If your players are going to be starting in this is this one low level town, right? Where all the adventurers start, or like the basic adventurers academy, you need to build that first and then you can build the surrounding area. And maybe what is the school system? Maybe the government, like how that is funded, but stay tight to exactly what you think is going to appear. We don't need to necessarily know thousands of years of history unless that has a direct impact on why people are the way they are today. So always start with what you need, you absolutely need. And once you've hit those boxes, you might find that you already have a 200 page book and then you can save the rest for an expansion or something more specific down the line. I, I like the, I mean, I agree 100% and I, I fight that urge sometimes to just go deep and compile all the notes. The other thing I'd say about world building in a campaign setting is you are, you should explain the foundations and what's unique about it. And you shouldn't go a thousand years into history unless it builds the foundations and shows what's unique about it. But you need to plant hooks and seeds everywhere because what you're trying to do is say, here is a world and you're trying to convince a, uh, you know, harried time pressed game master who is running your setting to, to pick up some shiny bauble from the setting guide and turn it into the next adventure. Right. If you talk about the Amazon queen over here and, and wow, she's got all these interesting things going on with the Griffins. Great. Um, if he's instead intrigued by, oh, the dwarves are being, you know, run out by something else. Great. But what you shouldn't do is, is just describe the people in places. You should be 
leaving great big stonking clues all over for hey this is a great place for a dungeon this is a great place for a city adventure these are bandits they could fight this is the elf court um it should just be lush with hooks and ideas and like pour your creativity into two sentences constantly that are how to adventure in this place um, Midgard does this explicitly called mm -hmm. adventuring in this region right like, I love those sections of the, the I, book. Just, I insisted on those uh, sections it's just it's so you you want to do that favorite for a GM if you've ever let one went through a setting guide or a monster guide and read something you're like oh my god I can instantly think of an adventure for that like that's the kind of stuff you want to be peppering in when you're making the world the history of today right the present day in your world you should have so many different conflicts going on in so many different places and people who clearly want things and don't write the it end is. of what that story is right it's there has been no turmoil that's in the this hard region. part yeah. right there has been turmoil in this region for the past 50 years as these two people are desperate to mine out this or whatever and then it's like put sentence end you don't say what happened to them like that is actively going on that is up for the dm and the players to to bring that to a resolution i like to think of it as essentially when you're world building for a campaign setting you are setting up the chessboard for somebody else yes. to play the game to play you the are game, setting yeah. putting all of the pieces in place so people can look at them and go oh that interaction is interesting Ooh, and then that could yeah. go there and then that that piece could move there and take this. Oh, but what would happen then? That's the GM's job is to finish the game. Your job yes. is to put pieces in the place. See, your analogy is so genteel and intellectual <laughs> chess pieces. The Midgard term for the, this process is called stacking up the gunpowder. <laughs> because... Well, you're Americans. You can't even help Because we're point. Americans, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> just leave this keg of gunpowder here and uh, walk we're away. Just... And... <laughs> And walk away. It's fine. Oh, we we welcome you, strangers from a foreign land. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same principle. I agree entirely, right? Like, you've got to leave um, the conflicts dangling. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to resist trying to tie them up neatly. Yeah. My big bugbear with lore and world building is people think world building is here is a map. Here are all the places on the map, and here are the people who live there. And I think world building is, and here are some really interesting character races and backgrounds that you can play. Yes. And here are some really interesting monsters that have really weird origin stories that I'm going to lead to. So <laughs> for me, the world building is, is actually the stuff that's in motion. Uh, I always say world building should be in motion and emotional. So it should be moving and doing something and also evocative, right? To make you feel something. Uh, and a lot of people think that the the gudumf, gazetteer, that's the world building. But actually the world building is in all the PCs and the, the monsters and the, the good stuff that you're gonna be throwing at your players. That That's the good world building. That's where the good stuff should be, in my the opinion. conflict, the drama, the mm -hmm. story, yes. Yeah, adventures, exactly. the action, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the people in places are the framework. Who is involved in the drama? Where does the bridge fall into the river? That's all great, but it is just the first layer. And you can think of world building as a layer cake where one part is, I have a map. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nice. What's on it? I have things on a map. And then the sparkly things or the frosting, right? The top of the layer cake that everyone's most excited about it. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's that drama, it's that conflict, yeah. So we've talked about how deep you should go in world building? How deep should you go with regard to stat blocks and monsters and that kind of thing? How much is too much? How much is not enough? Mm. Easy peasy question there. Yes, I think well. I think now in in this day and age, uh, when so many people are making campaign settings, it is critical to include player options uh, in whatever you are doing as a starting point. Uh, so one, yes, having those unique backgrounds, uh, having those those subclasses, having those mechanics that people can engage with so they can automatically see, oh, wow, why is this background in here? This must be a big deal. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that story because it gives you a practical way to show what people are doing in the world. And then also to engage players to buy the book and 
DMs to buy the book. So that's just top level. You should absolutely do that. And it does help you really see day-to-day -day life in the world. And it's similar to monsters. I think if you have whatever your big thing is about this world, the unique, interesting thing, you should have enough monsters to support how that thing manifests. So if there is a weird issue with like chaos magic or whatever it may be, have a few different sample creatures and make sure, of course, you have enough to cover each of the tiers of play, a spattering of different types of monsters, just a variety so uh, a DM can easily see everything they have in their toolbox for the occasion. And probably once that toolbox is filled, that's about it because you don't want this to be Oh, this isn't a monster book, right? This this isn't a player option book. Just enough to sell that toolkit uh, so people feel prepared and they, they have something unique to inspire everything else. Uh, I, I would love to write a setting book someday that has almost no mechanics in it. And for a time, Cobalt Press took out the player option pieces for settings. Uh, like, for instance, the Southland setting is a GM book, and the Southland player's guide is the player's guide. And they're meant to be a campaign setting together. The one sort of reality of putting your player options into your setting book is now you're handing one book around, mm -hmm. and the players, A, don't care, or B, shouldn't know all the stuff <laughs> in the Game Master section. So sometimes from a practical perspective, you do want to divide the, the GM's Fair part product. of the setting from the player part of the setting. But that's, you know, now you're talking about publishing two books. And with Southlands, mm -hmm. we did at the same time. Um, and a pa patch of adventures, right? So, um, but depending on where you are in sort of a publishing journey or a commercial journey, just publishing one book may be a, <laughs> a struggle. Um, much less two. Yeah, absolutely. But it's an option. Yeah. yeah. Or, tiny plug, use World Anvil, and then you can control exactly who sees which parts of your campaign <laughs> setting. <laughs> yeah. It's like we uh, were GMs who had already had this problem. It's like that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk about a space we've been dancing around, and I think it's a really important one that a lot of first-time writers forget about. Campaign settings are creation by committee. What do I mean by that? We as game write writers, uh, and I referred to us all earlier as some, some nerd in a room somewhere, um, we present these materials to a GM who has to perform the actual game. We've written the thing, but we're not the ones who actually make it happen. So how can we balance inspiration and guidance in a campaign setting and still leave space for the GM's creativity. Mm, well, that's really the, the nugget that's always the hardest part, right? Um, I'll go back to Midgard or Ebon Tides. There's parts of the map that just aren't explained in any detail, right? Um, and I think this has been a solution that was used in early Forgotten Realms where Sembia was really not it was like, you go do whatever you want there. We're not going to officially detail it. Um, the urge is, as we said earlier, to be encyclopedic about every location. But the reality is, if you name something and put down a sentence, oh, this town has a problem with owlbears, you know, that's probably enough for most game masters to say, ooh, problem with owlbears. I'll run with that. Um, if it's a major metropolis in the heart of the empire, you're going to need more. But I prefer to leave vast swaths of stuff unexplained in some areas, uh, either for further development if the setting is a hit, or just to say, you know, if the game master wants to fill it in, why should I interfere, right? Like, there, it's easy to go too far. And my take on the balance is, Give them three unique things about the place and then let them fill in the rest because otherwise you'll never fit it all in one set of covers. Yeah, I think it's it's so hard because a lot of this is like 
in the details uh, of how you write and how you, I think, present information in a lot of ways helps make it feel like an open world or a closed world. Oh, uh, yeah. Sidebars and stat blocks are right. your friends. And, and even referring to things as like, hey, cities in this type of place generally have these things. Here's a sample city. Like that kind of wording already encourages the idea in the subconscious, oh, there are others. And oh, this is just a sample version. So there must be others. And I can follow this template and make things. So building in those little toolbox moments. So the sample city, the sample fey court, the, the, the sample mm -hmm. monster hunting organization or faction, these things and, and the wording and giving people, yeah, just that, like you said that those three things, like all factions in the world probably have these three things. And then that's the invitation built right in there in the word, in the framing for GMs to, and players to take and run, run with that idea. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what you've touched on there is is always my solution to this, which is give them. Uh, I love random tables, not because I like mm. random tables. I hate using random tables. I love random tables because they are inspirational. Random yes. tables yeah. <laughs> set the boundary and set the inspiration for somebody else's creativity. I will oh, never sure. roll a random table. You're but going to love Book of Ebon Tides because oh, Celeste and I good ones. Oh, so, smooth. so many <laughs> random it. tables. I can't I even tell you how many I want to show. Like they're the just... encounter tables are yeah. great. Yeah. And they yeah. all have a story hook, but there's stuff in here. I'm just going to pick randomly. Oh, fashions of the Fey courts, gifts and glamours of the Fey. Hey, that's a yeah. D12 table, trickery and whimsy table, mm -hmm. greater umbral magic table. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's full of, what did we do? 30, 40 tables? We did a lot. I, I mean, I, I only did, I think I did the adventure, the encounter tables, but uh, yes. some of those, like uh, the cosmetic table and like the details and just ideas, uh, those are so, so great. Right. There's and like uh, <laughs> servants, servants and hirelings, yeah. uh, tricks that the gnomes like to play. Like yeah. every one of them is just loaded with, well, welcome to you know, 12 interesting ways to engage your players right now. And what I love about random tables, again, I don't like the randomness. I want to choose and very specific, but random tables tell your GMs what is important in this world. So you just did it right there. This is a fey place. So what's important? The way you look, glamours, hirelings and servants, because these are all important tropes and cultural facets of the fey. This is what's important yeah. in this world. And I am telling you that by giving you these options. And these options are just the jumping off point because you know what kind of fun your players like. I'm just here to tell you what kind of things are in this important space that you can start to play with. And that's what I love yes. about random tables. I love that they are a tray of possibilities that say this is important, this is important, this is important. Now go have fun. <laughs> Yes. Yes. No, that's absolutely the fun of tables. And I've seen over and over again when we get feedback from people about a particular Cobalt Press title, um, or even when we're still in the design phase, like, oh, this is a great table. I used it and I had so much fun, is, is a relatively common piece of, uh, of feedback. And, and it just encourages us to go off on more tables. So. And also, there um, it's a great, great tool, to and it doesn't take page after. Yeah, no, it just doesn't take up so much space in the book, right? Like you can jam a lot of ideas in a small space. Yeah, and they're they're great world building hooks as well. Yeah, honestly, yeah. like you can get a lot of world building in a like a D twelve table for books. There's so much yeah. world building. You fit so much world building. This bad boy. I'm just saying, um, because each book has a title and an author and a tiny little text about what it is. And every right. single one of those units is a just absolutely packed full of possibilities in terms of giving flavor, giving ideas, giving hooks. So yeah, tables. Sorry. <laughs> more of them. No, you're not more, wrong. More random tables. We love them. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think I think what we've really said there is, you know, paint evocative details like this town is having a problem with Albers. That's a very evocative. What kind of problem? What kind of albers? Who knows? You decide. Where um, did these bears come from? Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the problem they are having with Albers is that they have all taken up in the church and are having a tea party. It's not specified, but it could be that. People are turning um, into Albers. <laughs> What's going on? Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and so by being specific yet open, what you're doing is, you know, and this is what, this, what you guys have said, what you're doing is really leaving space for the GM. And then by giving them a good toolbox, you're showing them what kind of direction their creativity can go in, I think. Yeah. So let's finish off before we get to your excellent questions, which, by the way, you can still ask. Do get them in very soon. Um, what mistakes do you see in other publishers when writing campaign settings and how can we avoid them? I don't want to point a finger at other yeah, publishers. No, we make plenty of mistakes here. ourselves. <laughs> okay, what mistakes do you see in published writing uh, campaign okay. settings? Okay. There we go. Let's rephrase that. I don't want to make anyone feel bad. This is all about a didactic pedagogical learning experience. Mm -hmm. I... You might go Wolfgang. Yeah, I, we probably. Won't yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have opinions and I think it depends on the audience, right? Like right. there are publishers and Cobalt Press among them who, you know, maybe change the campaign setting frequently. This is something I think over time I learned it was a mistake. You want it to feel like a living, breathing thing. But over the life of a campaign setting, the bones have to stay the same. I don't know how many times the Forgotten Realms has been reset, but the usual fan reaction isn't, oh, delight, oh, joy, I learned more about the timeline, things have advanced. The usual reaction is, oh, no, you're making me learn things again. And you can wipe out someone's sense of mastery of a setting, and you can wipe out their engagement with a particular period of just these three years in Greyhawk are the important ones, or, you know, Midgard, it's just this section and that time frame that I care about. Don't mess with it. So I've learned that perhaps it's a mistake to expect the campaign setting to evolve at a fast pace. It evolves slowly, if at all. Um, so get it right the first time. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, kind of building on the back of that, I think uh, right now we see campaign settings look so different every time we open one. Every time a publisher puts out a new campaign setting, I feel like nobody really knows how to format these books and it's always like a, a yes. grand experiment. And I think that is something that you absolutely have to think of when you're world building how to present the information in a way that is going to be accessible and helpful because people don't really succeed most people do not succeed if you just have running blocks of text so if you're just intending to just tell everyone with the words you know what this world looks like chances are it's not going to to be engageable. You need to think in terms of, of visuals. So how are you going to organize the book? Are you going to have these specific options? Are you going to have encounters in this world? Are you going to show maps? Are you going to have charts? What are all the different ways you can present information and talk about the world? And you should be thinking about it in those terms, as opposed to just the traditional, like, we're going to sit down and write the Cimmerillion. Uh, because that that is, it's, it's hard to parse. So you have to think about education when you're thinking about your campaign setting and really build that in and start with those principles. Like, I love the campaign setting, the books that start with like, here are the things you need to know about this world. It's like the seven things to know or whatever. Start with that kind of information, the top level stuff, and then have the separate character chapter and have the separate like modern day, this is history. So that, that kind of stuff I think is hugely important. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that we call the player primer, um, yes. which is essentially like, dear player, you're about to go into a world that is not Earth. You need to know these things. You don't need to be overloaded with stuff, but you do need to understand some basic concepts before you start thinking about who you want to be, because otherwise you will plan a character that does not exist in this world, and then everyone right. will be sad. Yes. I think one of the fastest ways to do a player primer is actually not words at all. It's art. And we haven't talked about the role of art and graphics, but if you can display, look, here is a shadow fae, here's a bear folk, and here's a goblin, 
and you say, oh, it's kind of a phase setting, right? Um, or if you show a blasted wasteland, like, hmm, looks grim, Mad Maxi. The art will be the first clue to what you're walking into. So um, as writers and designers, we care about the words and that's where the depth of the setting will shine. Um, but wow, please, please don't underestimate just how much impact your art will have on the perception and the understanding of both GMs and players. Yeah, I want to jump on that train and say also design elements and also font. The colors you pick, yes. the fonts Colors you team. choose, the, yeah. the, the if your allowed texts are beautifully florid with gold festoons, that means one thing. Mm -hmm. If they're like on a jagged splat of blood, that means something else, right? You're tell you're giving me two different colors there. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that people don't always pay enough attention to. Yeah, cyberpunk books should look modern and glowy and neon. Yeah, well, all and those also sorts they of things. Should be written with that voice too, because uh, information in the future is brief, it's truncated, short sentences, like bullet points. Thinking of it. So you have to think about your world, and even with the words, like, oh man, are you going to have letters, look, right? Long right? letters from wizards in the world as these like sidebars, that that kind of presentation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm really glad that you touched on voice because that's a question we get asked a lot: is uh, how should I write my world building? Should it be like a Wikipedia article? Should it be like a, a bard's tale in a in a tavern? And the answer is, well, what is your player what experience? Your what yeah. kind of fun are we having here? Because you know, right. what well, if it's a pirate world? I want everything in sea shanties, and I want it now, uh, <laughs> or something. But you know. <laughs> Yes, I, it has to be appropriate, right? Like if we don't have, oh, I don't know, 12 fey toasts that are all mildly insulting as part of a fey book, like why Why are we even, right? Why are we and even? The, <laughs> right? And the pirate book should have a, if you have room for a diagram of rigging, yeah. At least you can tell people that's the for sale, that's the top sale. Let's you need it. a section on buried treasure in there, like in that <laughs> book. You need a random table of buried treasure. Otherwise, what are we doing? With that. Prosthetics, <laughs> hooks, pegs, and eye patches. You know, it's like that's what has to be there. It's all about uh, digging into what kind of fun we're having at the end of the yes, day. Yes, right? no, Lauren Chick is. I, I'm stealing that from him now as well. I'm going to quote good. him extensively. <laughs> I think it's it's a good way to summarize it. Are we ready for questions? We are. We are just about to do the questions. But just before we get there, I wanted to let you know that Mando Muk Mrs. Meltron, which is quite the username, has won the raffle. So please say something if you are here, because uh, you must claim your prize. Claim your prize. In the meantime, let's go to some audience questions. And we have some great ones. Um, I want to start with this one, which is very succinct. What are your top three pieces of advice for new creators designing their own homebrew setting? Um, OK, uh, uh, figure out what's different about your world as number mm -hmm. one. Um, number two is start with just what you need to run adventures mm -hmm. in this world and then three would be make sure you aren't going overboard with detail I yeah guess those are I'd, I'd sort of echo those i'd say one keep it small right like which is just what you need to think about what your players want or even ask them if you can bring in your players in a homebrew game to be part of your world building team if they're all obsessed with gnomes and i don't know whatever that you can play to things they want and if it's something they love and you love the world building will be much easier for you in a homebrew um because you don't have to please an audience of thousands or whatever you just have to please your table and they will love you for it uh, and the third thing I'd put forward is uh, a mood board, a scrapbook, a bunch of links for reference art. You, uh, I don't know, some of us are visual creatures. And if you can say, look, here's a monastery on top of a plateau and it looks kind of like this, and you have fantasy art reference, or you can say, this is sort of like Rivendell, like this. Um, you know, you don't care about copyright and legal restrictions on, hey, it's a lightsaber battle. Well, you don't care, you can just show it to your players. 
It's a fun um, homebrew. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Oh my god, I love homebrew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's treat. a separate talk. <laughs> it's a it's a whole treat after writing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man, until your homebrew becomes a new setting, right, Celeste? Yes, yes, and then you have to uh, go back and change names because when it started as a homebrew setting, you're like, no, that's from that book I read. Nobody will know. <laughs> Nobody will know. And now you're like, darn it. And now it I'm like, oh, name, no, changing the map in Photoshop. Like, why? <laughs> Amazing. All right. A great one from Tillis here. How do I make a campaign magically interesting? Quite often, the party has every kind of detect spell. The list of spells is quite restricted by the system. So do I just make up my own spells or are there other solutions? Ooh. Mm. I say you go by Deep Magic by Cobalt Press. Yeah, there's a lot of new spells no. in there. They'll never expect, no. Uh, I think thinking about no, how, that's... yeah, thinking about how people interact with magic in your world is one of the coolest parts uh, of, of building your homebrew world. And I would encourage, especially uh, newer GMs or people new to world building, uh, avoid a high fantasy setting where magic is bountiful and there are wizards running around everywhere uh if you can get more of a low fantasy setting where like wizards are incredibly rare there are only a few born every generation and you absolutely like if you see a magic item in a bazaar in a town that is a huge event and everybody's gonna want that item so make the rules uh establish them early so your players are on board yes. and they understand that it's not a punishment but it's a it's a special it's a really special thing when they do get something new or magical or a new way to interact with it i would yeah, give you making it rare is an easy way to make it interesting absolutely yeah. i would give you one more solution if you are already mid-game and you're trying to do something which is take them somewhere where the magic is so weird that until mm. they got accustomed to it, they will have no idea what is going on. Now, it may be that they will spend time and they will, over a certain time, start to get more accustomed. And finally, the spells will start to work. The detect magic spells will start to work because they've become accustomed to this completely new culture of spellcasting. But if everything is old hat, just take them somewhere new. Just bring back the mystery and the what the hells. Because do you know what? That's what magic. That's why magic is special. Like it, they say, um, uh, when you uh, what is it? Dissecting a joke is like dissecting dissecting a frog. It's not very funny, and the frog dies. It's kind of the same with magic, right? <laughs> uh, uh, dissecting magic becomes terribly unmystical, and the more lists of magic, the more ways you can decode and codify and detect and understand magic, good, the less magical it gets. So extrapolating and just taking it one step remove and being like these are spellcasters in the avedo jungle and they have a completely different way of connecting with the magical magic force and uh their culture is completely different and their focuses are completely different and uh off you go have fun you don't know what's going on this will be fun <laughs> put them in the deep end oh yeah, it's, fun. It, it's a little bit mean but if they're getting bored or if you feel like it's getting boring change something big and find a world-building reason why it makes sense or throw them Magic into a different dying plane. yes uh, yeah. sure different plane yeah. you know stuff's different here magic too off you go have fun don't die <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm a very nice gm i should be clear about that but uh, every now and then i do say off you go have fun don't die <laughs> Okay, last question. I thought this was a wonderful one to end on. When working on a campaign, how do you find a balance between activities to interest and engage new and experienced players and make the campaign attractive and challenging for both? So we're talking about new players and experienced players. I think this is really a matter of uh, organization of your information is going to be huge. So because a lot of players who have been especially playing D&D for a really long time are used to those those huge modules and books that are just running lines of text with like maybe the occasional small art in there. Uh, or they're used to reading lots of these heavy fantasy novels that define the genre. So that's OK for older players. But for newer players, you really got to go to those graphics, the flow charts to the seven things you need to know about this world, really building in those very, very small pieces. And don't assume 
anything. Don't assume people know what a dragonborn is. Don't assume assume people know what a dragon is. Uh, <laughs> we we have a lot of assumptions, I think, built into this genre uh, that we sometimes need to take a step back. Like just because I haven't been enjoying fantasy for decades and decades doesn't mean that these new folks coming to it know anything. So even right. if it seems like overkill, make sure to take the time uh, to hit the basics and build up. Fantastic. Anything to add there, Wolfgang? I think that covers it. I mean, you are trying to hit two audiences at the same time, and that is a challenge for any designer. Um, I, I think I would just throw in a plug for summaries and subheads mm -hmm. to make it easy to scan your material, no matter whether you're an advanced player or a new player. If it, you can, one way to break up the wall of text is just with more headings, more paragraph breaks, more bulleted lists, more sidebars. Um, at some point in your writing process, break it down into smaller chunks and label each little chunk so that people can scan it as a reference work later. Yeah, put an index in. <laughs> that, that oh kind gosh, of, indexes. That kind of good stuff. <laughs> you know, so much work tables, and so worth right? it. Yes. You know, monsters Hyperlink your terrain. wiki. Huge. Do it. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Use World Anvil. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like All we made something things. for this. But yeah, yes. no, we say in the blog world, people only read uh, titles and, and bullet points. That's what people read. Yeah. yeah. Headers yeah. and bullet points. So yeah. yeah, good formatting is everything, guys. Good formatting. It really, we were talking about this before and the you know, using fonts and using the right, the right feeling, but also clear formatting so people can read stuff is, yeah. Yeah, it's the difference between uh, working to play the game and falling into playing the game. It's that like last yes. best hurdle, if you want. Yeah, it looks beautiful. You want to keep reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, um, can you tell me just a little bit about the book of Ebon Tides? Because, of course, uh, <laughs> that's what you guys have been working on it together. And it happens to be a campaign setting. Yes, I will say that it is, it started as the Court of the Shadow Fae, which was an adventure. And for years, people said, we love this adventure. It's so full of Fae magic and wonderment and it's a very different world. Where's the rest of the setting? And I would say, well, there isn't one. It's just an adventure. So and cool. eventually, after I'd heard <laughs> that maybe a dozen times, I said to myself, where is the rest of the setting? Um, and I made it my job and, and Celeste helped. Uh, we, had, we collaborated on a shadow plane full of fae, bear folk, umbral humans, courts, weird magic, evil gnomes. Um, it's a delightful place, which is just in the shadows next door. You can attach it to any existing nice. homebrew or campaign setting because all you need is a doorway and a shadow, right? Mm -hmm. Lock and load. load. Fall into a fairy ring and you're there. Whoops. Yes. <laughs> don't die, as you said, Janet. Don't die. Have fun. Don't die. <laughs> yes. This is why I don't have children. Um, <laughs> I have players instead. No, no. Um, so that that is what these beautiful beans have been working on. The book of Ebon Tides. You can follow the link that is in the chat to go and learn more about it. It is truly spectacular. And if you are interested in uh, writing your own campaign setting, you could do worse than coming to join us for our summer camp event, where we will be taking you through 31 prompts in 31 days and uh, essentially helping you build out the first part or a corner of an existing world setting. Absolutely perfect for campaigns. I wrote the prompts myself. Yep, with this in mind. Um, and if you do take part, you might even win some juicy Cobalt Press goodies because you guys are giving away, uh, again, a whole bunch of copies of this yes. book, aren't you? Yes, we are. Excellent choice. Oh, yeah. So um, there will be a big prize draw for people who have participated in that challenge as well. So one more time, if you go to worldanvil.com forward slash summer camp, you will be able to find out all about that challenge. Uh, take part, win more Cobalt Press goodies because they have very kindly sponsored this community event and uh, build some of your summer camp uh, sorry, some of your campaign setting using the summer camp prompts as well. That is all we have time for. So I must say a massive thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you so much for coming on today to talk to us. 
Thanks for having us. And Celeste, it is always a pleasure here. to chat with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you all so much for being such an awesome audience. Uh, thank you. Yeah, there were great questions today as well. I would like, of course, to give a massive thank you to everyone here in the chat today who has asked amazing questions, said hilarious things. I've been giggling at your comments as we've been going on. Uh, this interview will be up on our YouTube channel and it will be coming out on our podcast as well. So do stay tuned. You can go and follow us in those places to see it again, basically. And it will also be available on the VOD. So if you heard something you thought was great and you want to hear it again, then you can do that in those places. We are going on a very special raid today. We are going to raid how to make a D&D podcast over on the YouTube channel. It's live. We're going to go join it. So I would like to invite you all to grab your hammer and go world build. Bye, guys. <laughs>